Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. We are joined by a very special guest, Glenn Dakin. He's a writer and a cartoonist. Oh. He's uh, joining us all the way from the UK, and we thank you uh, very much for taking the time. I know it's evening over there. How are you? Uh, great. Yes, we're, we're in lockdown here, but uh, we're having fun. I'm managing to write nearly, you know, well, uh, just carrying on as normal, really. Uh, a few less distractions uh, for creative people. We're getting quite a lot done. Mm. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm fine. Uh, uh, just a little correction there, uh, Ryan. Not just a writer and cartoonist, but Star Trek writer. Well, he's <laughs> run the gamut of a ton of things. But yeah, for this purposes, everybody yeah. listening, they're like, yeah, yeah, just cut to the chase. It's the <laughs> Star Trek guy, right? It's it's Star Trek, right? Yes, it's Star yeah, Trek. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> Me my poetry or something like that. Uh, although I did, you know what? I'm feeling rebellious today. Uh, we're <laughs> Americans. We're a rebellious type. You also did uh, do uh, some comics for the real Ghostbusters, actually, which I had no idea. Uh, I've done, yeah, I've done. I've written loads of comics over the years. I've done stuff for Marvel Comics, and uh, uh, have you heard of a thing called Doctor Who? Oh, we've heard of it. The yeah. Carrie version of Star Trek. Um, yes. Yeah, I've written loads of comics like that, and uh, I had great fun writing the real Ghostbusters. And, uh, mm. We I've call also it. Done... We're we're very proper, so we call it Doctor Whom. Doctor Whom, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I've done. Uh, if you look at the background behind you, which you probably won't see because it's not there really behind you, um, that's there's my character Abe is like an autobiographical comic strip about my own life, which is one of the things I'm known for. Awesome. Oh, that's great. So for the purposes of this interview, uh, we've got three books that we really want to highlight. One is Mr. Spock's Little Book of Mindfulness. One is Star Trek Cocktails. And the other one is Star Trek Quibbles with Tribbles. Um, this is from a branch of Eagle Moss. Uh, there, there we go. Oof. That's the one we're going to want to talk about the most, I bet. This is the Cocktails. <laughs> Oh, so uh, it's a new publication company called Hero Collector, which is a branch of Eagle Moss. So those of you that collect ships, we know a lot of people that collect a lot of ships, like our good friend Peter Karuba has over 100 ships hanging from his ceiling. Uh, so he knows all about you guys and uh, you guys do great work. But publishing company, huh? Hero Collector. Yes, this is our, this is our, our new um, new wave, really, where we're just going to have a lot of fun with this. We've started out producing uh, books which are really inspired by our model spaceship collections. Uh, but, but now we're doing stuff kind of a bit more uh, left field, like uh, Mr. Spock's Book of Mindfulness and uh, the Cocktails and uh, the Nerd Search, which is all about... Um, uh, creating amazing artworks based on Star Trek, which are full of the most irritating mistakes uh, to, to annoy the fans. So uh, we know how much fans love uh, picking apart their favorite shows. It's kind of like something you do, you know, when you really love a show, you go, yeah, but why did he do that? Why on earth did uh, Spock, you know, not, not mind meld with a guy and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So we've created, we've gone to the original series for that one because we just wanted to start at the beginning so we've got oh. we've got these uh, scenes from the original series, and we've put in stuff that never happened, characters that shouldn't be there, and uh, only the true Star Trek fan will know. Uh, and they, you know, kind of annoy people. It's one of those things where you know people always really hate it if you call Mister Spock Doctor Spock that kind of thing. So, <laughs> yeah, we're going for all those little. Um, Annoying little things that will drive the fans nuts. You, you get a chance to try and spot them uh, throughout the book. Oh, my God. That is so fun. Sirach, we know all about yeah. those guys that just nitpick the hell out of Star Trek. Then this is just focused on the original series. Are you going to do one for every series? <sighs> That's what we would like to do. I mean, it's just this is just the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. I've been involved in an enormous next gen rewatch during lockdown. So uh, I'm kind of psyching myself up for the for the next one. But we might do. Uh, that's what we would like to do. But we're going to have to see how it goes. But most people, um, you know, the, the original series of Star Trek kind of reached out, didn't it? They're beyond uh, the science fiction audience. So there's a there's a kind of a recognition there. I think that. Um, Hopefully, it'll be a good one to start with. Hmm. 
the artwork that's um, behind Ryan, is that um, is that something that you did? Yeah, that's the, that's my own kind of um, my own sort of sketchy uh, comic style, a bit impressionistic. That's um, that's more like the artwork in uh, Mr. Spock's Mr. Spock's book of mindfulness. Um, yeah. It's a bit more like the New Yorker style of cartoon. Um, it's not like comic book art. Uh, we've got a proper comic book artist on the on the on the quibbles with tribbles. Um, a guy who illustrates lots of fantasy stuff for Marvel comics and uh, fantasy comics here in the UK. So this is like full color, um, full color proper comic book art. Uh, Actually, the, can you hold that up a little while longer so we could get a good look at it? So, oh, thanks. <laughs> Gotta buy it. You can see. I feel like I'm uh, doing a sales presentation. Yeah. You can see here. Can you see that one? Yes. Yeah. And that Day is more of traditional. That's more traditional comic book art. Yeah, this is this is more traditional. My style is a bit more, um, like I say, a bit more like independent indie comics. Um, but we've got some amazing scenes in here. Um, this is a. This is one of the scenes from the Trouble with Tribbles, where we re we recreated the scene in the in the, the bar on the space station and we put about a million tribbles in there and loads of characters who shouldn't be there. People actually, there are some DS nine characters in there because of trials and tribulation. Nice. nice. Right. Very cool. I've given, I've given away one of the, one of the sneaky things there, but we, we sneaked in a few DS nine characters into that spread, but they're not all, uh, some of them, they, they could have been there. <laughs> so what we call that nowadays is reimagining. You reimagined the Troubles with Tribbles scene uh, with the Space Nine characters and a bunch of others that will remain nameless for now. So that's really cool. That sounds like that's something that even like the biggest Star Trek nerd might, uh, might have some problems with. Like some of them might be obvious and others are probably less so. Is that right? Yeah, so there's there are some of the um, some of the mistakes in the book are a bit sneaky. They're like conceptual mistakes. So there's like a person behaving out of character, and you would say, well, that person would never do that. But uh, sometimes they're just monsters in the wrong place, or people uh, wearing the wrong. Um, for example, they might be wearing the dress uniform in a scene where they were wearing their regular uniform. So it's very very petty. You have to be really <laughs> you have to be really <laughs> to understand. Oh my goodness! We had a ball. Perfect. We had a ball putting it together. I was working um, with Ben Robinson, one of the, my project managers here at Clayton. He's behind loads of the Star Trek spaceships, and we had a lot of fun going through the the scenes, thinking what would really annoy the fans that we got wrong in this scene. You know, <laughs> someone's got someone's got the wrong weapon, or someone's got the wrong hairstyle. You know, some Spock's got his uh, menagerie. Um, shirt on or something like that you know the d different uniform mistakes and things that the fans do pick up on I think you you might agree I think that's awesome I actually yeah. do a lot of that with my uh, daughter sometimes when we go places they give you a little playbook and you have to spot the thing that's missing or misplaced or you know those kinds of things so that's already just in general uh, a fun challenge but when you com combine that with uh, the love for Star Trek and the kind of details and information that goes into it, I think that's like a real kind of treasure hunt almost. Uh, the, the the fun thing uh, the fun thing about it is that um, it's you know this is really for Star Trek fans. It's like there's stuff in here that the average person wouldn't wouldn't realize was wrong, and you can look at these scenes. It'd be quite fun to like play it with a friend, you know, and uh, try and uh, spot the mistakes first, because we've had a lot of fun putting the putting the stuff in. And in the back, there's a lot of there's a kind of chatty answer section where we explain uh, why we've put included some of the mistakes and why some of them aren't really mistakes. So it's kind of quite. Um, it's kind of like recreating the conversation you might have at a convention uh, if you were arguing about, you know, um, your favorite episode. Um, you know, why did they do that? He wouldn't have come in, you know. So we've tried, it's a bit like recreating that kind of uh, convention conversation. And so, but you know, I think I think uh, you can enjoy it on your own, or you might have fun uh, reading it with somebody else. I don't know. Star Trek fans don't 
quibble about minutia in Star Trek episodes at conventions. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I think to do. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, really, I really love your art style. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Glenn, but I really love your art style. I personally would buy a piece of that artwork and put it on my wall because I think it's very, um, I just, it's artistic and, and it's fun and it, and it does have that New Yorker style to it. Mm. Um, uh, are you talking about the style of, on the website or the style in the, the, st the style in this book? Cause I didn't, I didn't illustrate this book. I illustrated the stuff on the website. No, I like the stuff on the website. I like this. the more, yeah, the more simple. Yeah. Fun looking like, characters. I spent my whole time at art college trying to, to learn to draw like someone who didn't know how to draw and um, think I've succeeded quite well. <laughs> uh, so, oh, by the way, for everybody listening in or watching, uh, we are going to include the links for all of these books so you can get them on amazon.com. Uh, just a reminder for those of you who think it might still be April because the world kind of stopped back in March, <laughs> but the holidays are actually coming up by the way. By the way, holidays are coming up, so if you want to get gifts for people, this would be great. You're gonna get uh, you're gonna get, get them all. Yeah, your Star Trek friends. You can make them so happy and watch them blow a fuse with this book. Um, you don't what, even was, need that that. The, was that the plan to release all three of them at the same time, or um, I don't think we are the, quite that well organized. I think it might have happened by the <laughs> same. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I think what I think one of the ones was the the cocktail book. There was a kind of a gap in the the schedule, and they said, "Ah, what are we going to do?" And the, someone came up to me and said, "You are going to do another book." So uh, we managed to get that one in the in the in the lockdown here in the UK. We were doing it all over Zoom, so we had a mixed cocktail mixologist in Paris, and we had another mixologist in London, and we had me writing the stuff, and we had an artist somewhere, you know, somewhere else, and we were all collaborating on Zoom. So we we had to find a whole new way of working, really, uh, mm. to get it together. So let's talk about uh, that book. Uh, we call them bartenders, but you guys are so much classier than we do. You call them mixologists, mm -hmm. people that come up with uh, these great beverages. Are they all alcoholic or some are non-alcoholic? Well, it's funny. I've just been dis uh, discussing this with my wife because she was saying, you really should have included some non-alcoholic <laughs> uh, I, I, I think uh, I think it was suggested at an early stage that we could do. I, see, I thought perhaps the Vulcan ones initially because Mr. Spock, you know, it's not really a very Vulcan thing to, to boot, to booze. So, uh, but it, uh, gradually, for some reason or other, that that, I, that got uh, shunted aside. So uh, it is, they are basically um, alcoholic cocktails, yeah. But what's the, what was the idea behind, like, creating the mixtures? What, what, what was the thing that you would make you say, oh, let's use rum or this ale or this kind of uh, liquor as opposed to another? There's um there are, well there are different ways that we approached it. One of them is that there are certain characters who are associated with certain cocktails, and there are also certain mm -hmm. characters who are associated with certain places that are famous for cocktails. Okay. So, for example, we've got Cisco's Sazerac, which is New Orleans cocktail. Wow! And uh, you've got a you know you've got the strong connection there, which is perfectly. In fact, in fact I think it's the state cocktail. Uh, and uh, that's an, that is an amazing um, mixture. Uh, I think it's of uh, whiskey and brandy with a touch of absinthe and some other bitters and stuff. I mean, it's a, that is a crazy one. But uh, <laughs> uh, for example, we've got um, Pike from uh, Discovery. Uh, he, he was. Um, we've got Pike's Mojave Mojito because he grew up in the, on the edge of the Mojave Desert. So we've done our research of that with some of the some of the characters we've got dr mccoy's mint julep because he famously um tried to get jim to chill out and have a mint julep in uh, this as it uh, this side of paradise in the original series mm. some of them like uh, the warp core breach that's um that's that's from quark in our book that's from quark's bar and that's in las, that in las vegas uh no no i mean it's from okay it's in, in, the, in the actual tv show uh he he gives um he makes one for um bashir and says uh, he says give me a drink uh dr bashir says give me a drink that'll help me relax and quark gives him the warp core breach and he says 
this will make you relax for about three days. <laughs> <laughs> and it right. has, uh, it has um, like three different kinds of rum and four different kinds of fruit juice. And it has a kind of weird mist coming out the top. And uh, I think it's the kind of drink that probably pre-COVID you, you would have shared with other people because it might be a bit too much for one person. Right. Yeah. The reason uh, the reason I asked about Las Vegas is uh, back in the day, I think it closed in 2009, but in Star Trek Las Vegas, sorry, in, uh, at the Las Vegas Hilton, they had the Star Trek experience and that had a big Quark's bar and one of, you know, and it was just everything was Star Trek uh, related. And one of the drinks was a warp core breach. Uh, and I do believe that was one of the ones that you could share with other people, but that's cause I think it had like 14 shots of alcohol and it was in a big fishbowl. It, it comes in a fishbowl. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, so it, it is that one. The future, man. You, know, you, you can't just have it in a glass. You've got to have something. In the future, <laughs> but yeah, in the future, in the future we'll all be drinking from fishbowls. There's something to look forward to, uh, you know, the human progress. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to have to invest early. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there is there a drink in there, in that book, that you thought, okay, there's no way this is going to taste good? Like you saw all the different ingredients and you just didn't think it could work and then you like tried it or you heard from somebody else that it's actually amazing? Uh, there is a pretty, there's, there's a couple, you know, I don't know, some people quite like dessert style cocktails where you might have a cocktail, uh, instead of a, a pudding. Well, well, in England, we call your pudding. Do you call it your, your, uh, your, after your, your sweets, you know, and there's one called uh, to bibble with tribbles, which is kind of almost very sickly, <laughs> it's very sweet, uh, combination of ingredients, but they're, they're, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I, um, I think that one. I think that one will appeal to people with a sweet tooth. But a lot of the drinks are based on really um, well-known uh, and long-lasting cocktails, but they've been given a Star, a Star Trek twist. So uh, there's a kind of little bit of a, a fun fun to it. You know, it's, uh, we've we've taken another one from the series, which is called the Samarian Sunset, right? Which, does it oh, actually yeah. change colors when you flick it? Well, it, it, it does, but you, it doesn't. It doesn't quite work the way data made it. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> he, he, you know, he is an android. But um, they have a lovely. Uh, they do have the lovely color change effect if you make it in the right order. Wow. And we and we have one with Odo as well. Uh, he uh, the Odo uh, chameleon, and mm. um, uh, that's another uh, color changing drink. So. Um, that's a, that's a good one. They're quite fun. You know, we've got them. We've got, I, I'm saying mixologists because these are experts in cocktails. These aren't just ordinary. We haven't just w gone into any pub and asked, you know, and uh, <laughs> thrown together yeah. a cocktail. <laughs> Actually, it reminds me, my, uh, my brother once worked in a Greek bar making cocktails in an island. And uh, he, um, he was told how to make them all, you know, by the owner of the bar. This is on the island of Naxos. And, um, one day this guy didn't turn up for work so my brother was on his own and he was just having to <laughs> he was just having to invent cocktails on the spur of the moment but people didn't seem to mind he was just pouring anything into these glasses and a table came with about five people you know and they he made them all these random cocktails just pouring anything in and he was he, he thought they would complain but they absolutely loved it but then the, uh, after that they said to him uh, same again and he had absolutely oh, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had absolutely no idea what he'd given them. But I think by that stage they didn't really they didn't really mind. Yeah, he's like, well, it was carrot juice, rum, <laughs> and uh, a Gibson onion. <laughs> Out there on the islands, you know, they invent they brew their own stuff and they mm. stick it in a, you know, in a Jack, Jack Daniels bottle, but I'm it's all made up in the mountains, you know. And uh, anything with Jaegermeister in the book? Uh, we don't have that, no, I'm afraid to say. No. Okay, good. No, that's a good thing. I was <laughs> I'm trying to stay away from that. Yeah, Ciroc doesn't like the black licorice flavor so much. Yeah. We have got um, we have got a prune juice um, cocktail nice. in honor of, of Worf. A warrior's <laughs> drink. <laughs> it's, it's like Worf was in the room with us. Um, <laughs> actually, Worf he gets into it twice because he gets in on his uh, next gen and his DS9 credentials. There's one called Worf's Smooth Move, which is a <laughs> prune juice um, cocktail. 
And there's another one called um, Parmac on the Beach. Is my is my Klingon mm. pronunciation correct there? I believe um, so. Pa Parmac is um, the Klingon uh, version of romance, except slightly more aggressive. It's it's oh, it's a version okay. of it's a version of the cocktail sex on the beach, um, with okay. a Klingon twist. Yeah, nice. nice. <laughs> that is a fun one. one. So, yeah. so far you've got a book to get people drunk off Star Trek stuff and then for them and then afterwards for them to look at all these illustrations and try to pick out what's <laughs> not Star Trek. This is like you've got a built in Star Trek party in these books here. Absolutely. Well, the thing is, you could, re you know, you could read the book have a few cocktails and then you can read it all over again because you won't remember. <laughs> <laughs> You've had your mind melded. Uh, but I wanted to ask a little we bit have about got... Quibble with Tribbles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say again. I wanted to ask you about Quibble, uh, Quibble with Tribbles. That's, that's the, that's the nerd's the... book. That's the, yeah, this that's Quibbles with Tribbles, the nerd okay. search, where you have to find the mistakes. The third okay. book is uh, Mr. Spock's Little Book of Mindfulness. And that's the one that I can't even guess. I have no idea what this one's about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, Mr. Spock has a very uh, enlightened and uh, thoughtful and uh, logical character. And we thought that in this kind of uh, mirror universe that we've been living in for a couple of years where life seems to have gone a bit crazy, uh, that, that people would, would turn to his calm um, and witty uh, wisdom to, um, you know, in, in difficult times. So we've taken a lot of quotes from episodes and things that Mr. Spock has said, and we've used mm. it to kind of analyse modern life. So we've taken stuff like Vulcans are absolutely... Uh, they have a great ability to focus on one task at a time and get things done. Whereas in the modern world, one of our biggest problems is uh, distraction. You know, we're almost incapable of watching our favorite TV, even if it's our favorite TV show. I mean, I was watching uh, Discovery the other day and I was checking my mail and it's like, it's ridiculous. Just because one of the scenes was ever so slightly, you know, t I was going to say slow, I don't want to disrespect anybody's work. But I was like... Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I was like checking my mail during the scene and I was thinking, you know, it really is, it's almost impossible for people to do one thing properly. And it's what we call unitasking because the, mm. ever since we've been told, especially as males, that we're incapable of multitasking, we feel like we should be doing several things uh, at once. And uh, Mr. Spock is great example of, um, great example of focus to the point where people think of him as a, uh, as a computerized person, as a machine. But we kind of analyze that through the, you know, through looking at the show and uh, how it often saves the day. Wow. Yeah, you know, uh, that thing about men being not as good at, at multitasking, I resent that. I think I'm very good at multitasking. My brain is just only on one thing, though. So if I'm watching Discovery <laughs> and I go, let me check my mail for three seconds, and I go, whoops, what just happened? Now I got to go back and rewind Discovery to see the thing that I just looked away from for five seconds. That's can't. because they know you've looked away. They, they, they wait until you've looked away and then they make, something, they make something interesting happen. They've got an algorithm, you know, somewhere. <laughs> Is Spock your favorite character? I, it's kind of funny because, uh, you know, I think one of the great things about the Star Trek shows is it's the it's the combination of characters, you know, that makes it work. I think in the original series, it was the repartee between Kirk, Spock and McCoy right. that brought those characters to life. It was because Spock was always challenged. You know, if he had just been a know-it-all, I think we wouldn't have liked him. But because every time he opened his mouth, somebody said, For Christ's sake, you know, my hey, God. That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> It's pretty We're good. We're talking about logic. These think of the lives, Jim. So you know, it's kind of like uh, I think um, Spock is one of my favourite characters. But I think very cleverly in Gene Roddenberry's original concept, he was part of a blend, and I think that's what we've tried to keep that spirit in the books. You know, this isn't just Mister Spock pontificating. We refer to other characters, and we talk about. Uh, aspects of the shows and the movies, you know, where there's some wisdom or something, something uplifting that we can take away. That's good. Uh, 
I was going to ask a question that's along the same lines. It's similar to what Sirach just asked you, but am I correct in assuming that the original series is your favorite series? Do you have one? Or if you don't want to answer that, who's your least favorite character? No, don't answer that one. <laughs> it seems it seems a bit mean, doesn't it? Um, I know that when I was I know that when I was young, I I really didn't like them having um, Wesley in the in Star Trek just because I didn't like them having kids on um, grown up shows. It made no think... kids on the bridge. <laughs> However, they handled a slightly a similar situation very well in DS Nine, where it wasn't um, you know there wasn't this kind of know it all quality um, which Wesley had. Right. Uh, but do you have a favorite series? I guess it would have to be the original series, I'm mm. afraid. Um, it was, it's just because, I mean, when it came along, and I was a very, I was a young child, you know, teenager at the time, um, there was nothing like it. You know, it was a completely new idea. It had its own, it had its own jargon. It had its own style, the way people dressed. Mm -hmm. I mean, you take it for granted now, but when you put Star Trek on and you saw the costumes, the attitude, you know, it really felt like a, it felt like they were really there, you know, it didn't have, I mean, if you watch Next Generation, they sometimes look like they're sitting around in an airport lounge, you know, when they're on the bridge, um, <laughs> like waiting for their flight to depart. There's a kind of relaxed quality, but there's a military air to the original series. You're, you know, there's right. a kind of feeling of being on the edge of Armageddon. It was very, very gripping. And I think, um, I think it just kind of changed everything, really. The fact that there's been, you know, many, many uh, other versions of it since then. So I'm, I probably will have to say that's my that's my favorite version. Hmm. You know, um, you mentioned Doctor Who earlier, and one thing that I do see a lot of at Star Trek conventions is Doctor Who fans, and I think there's a lot of crossover right. there. Is that, yeah. is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, we produce loads of uh, Doctor Who uh, stuff as well. I mean, I've written uh, for a Doctor Who comic here in the UK, and um, it's a similar kind of thing in a way because um, it's science fiction with a, with a heart. You know, it's science fiction with humour and with um, kind of ideas. You know, where the stories aren't just stories. They have a. They tell you they you know, the best episodes. They tell you something. Uh, they have they tell you something about life or they they surprise you with you know you're one minute you're watching a show about robots trying to take over the world and then you suddenly realize uh, that we are the robots or you know you kind of they twist they twist uh, they twist it round so they're like mini fables the, be the best episodes are and i think yeah. you know star trek is like that i mean so many of the episodes they have this memorable uh, memorable core to them that you can you know it's instantly memorable when you when you say to people um the city on the edge of forever or something you know people they remember that right. for, they they remember all the ingredients um yeah hmm. is uh is writing something that you always wanted to do growing up were you inspired by the shows and that made you want to write about whatever those shows happen to be, or were you? Was it something you always wanted to do? Did you start off as a cartoonist, and then you figured, well, I could write the story around the art? I uh, yeah, I, th I think you know when I was a kid, there was no vi video recorder, there was no DVDs, there was no uh, web. So when your favorite TV show was over, you you really thought you were never going to see it again. I mean, imagine that now. Imagine you're sitting there. And you're watching the latest episode of Star Trek and you're thinking, I am never going to see this again. So you would spend all week discussing it with your friends. You know, and you would say, why did they do that? What did that look like? Why does he say that? No, no, they're not proton torpedoes. They're photon torpedoes, you know. And um, I think, um, oh, sorry, completely lost my thread there. <laughs> oh, what uh, what inspired you to get yeah, so into writing? Yeah, so I think it was the fact that you th that it once the show was over, you thought it was gone forever, but you didn't want it to end. You wanted to keep it going. So um, I kind of, you know, I'd get a little exercise book out, and when when Star Trek was over, I would start writing my own, start writing my own story. But I, I always got a bit bored of um, serious stories. I, by about panel three, I was starting to stick jokes in and um, having fights break out, and uh, you know. So I could never take it too seriously, but I think there is that element, that slightly surreal element in Star mm. Trek that does that does bring out the humor in people, and um, 
I think it's one of the one. Of, yeah. So it was trying to trying to keep thing trying to keep the imagination and the fantasy world going. And so I, I would sit around drawing my own little comics. And I think that's where you start to develop the storytelling skills. Even if you're drawing a little cartoon, you're learning to get across a story to the person who's going to look at it. But if it's supposed to be funny and they don't laugh, then you're, then you're <laughs> gutting. So you have to find a way. No, you have to find a way to put the joke across so that people can get it. And you, you learn those skills almost without realizing it. Yeah. So I, I, I did start out as a cartoonist. I mean, I used to, mainly draw uh comics like my my aid comic about my own life and i very very i started to find that people were employing me to write stuff as well and i found i could write a heck of a lot quicker than i could draw um so i kind of evolved more into a writer uh, than um than a cartoonist but i was asked to illustrate um the spot book of mindfulness um by uh, Ben Robinson, who this was his idea at Hero Collector. And um, he came up to me one day and said, what do you think about writing a book called Mr. Spock's Little Book of Mindfulness? It was all there in his mind. And uh, I said, okay, I'll, when do you want me to start, basically? But, the, but he said, also, I want you to do the cartoons. And um, it's, it's actually kind of suited my style to draw these kind of minimal um, impressionistic little drawings of Spock. So they have more the air of a New York cartoon than of a, than of a comic book adventure. And they have a little funny little observations about life. Uh, and they tie in with the quotes from Spock's uh, culture and from the episode. Yeah, you know, I, 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 the name came to me, what, what your artwork <clears throat> style or your artistic style reminds me of. And that is my favorite um, art when I go to these conventions that I see for sale is the Hirschfeld. Hirschfeld, is that? Am I saying it right? Mm. Hirschfeld. I don't know Hirschfeld. that one. Yeah, do you, mean the old, do you mean the old cartoonist Hirschfeld? Or? Yes, yes, the, yes. The old cartoonist Hirschfeld. I think he's he's passed away now. He's, but um, he has these collection of different pictures that he made of Kirk and Spock, and I think he made a DS Nine one as well. And and those are actually my favorite, uh, you know, cartoon artists. Uh, depictions of, of of Star Trek characters, but when I see yours now, that reminds me of that, and I thought, oh wow, that that's the kind that's of style nice. that I like. Thank yeah, you. I mean, it, it's a bit it's a bit of a dis, it's a bit of a distillation of the of the characters and getting across a sort of essence of them, mm -hmm. rather yeah. than creating a very detailed uh, and beautiful artwork, because it's never right. really been my my style. I, I like a drawing to have some kind of kick to it, but I don't. I hate it when you, you know, when you draw something and people say, that must have taken you ages, you know, that, and it's kind of like uh, the false compliment, you know, and uh, it looks like you've worked very hard on this, doesn't it? <laughs> that's the, that, you know, that's the thing I, that's the thing I don't want to hear. So I, 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 I draw something about eight times and I just keep the one that I like and throw the other seven away so that every drawing has a sense of life about it. And they, they have a quick, they have a, uh, drawing something eight times. It must have taken you ages to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take me, honestly, it doesn't take me to draw something eight times. Uh, yeah. I would actually have a recommendation for you, just a suggestion, but I would love to see some of those illustrations on a T-shirt or some kind of piece oh, of Oh, yeah. Well, well, actually, we are, we are doing that. We, we are branching out into what they call apparel, and you can get uh, in fact we should send we should send uh, we should send something over to you um i'll try and get onto it we got we've got uh, uh, i think we've got six different mr spock t-shirts now wow. uh, one of my favorite quotes from mr spock uh, from vulcan wisdom is nothing unreal exists so we've got a nothing unreal exists t-shirt which i think is is very nice oh wow i think that's and, on your website too if i remember correctly i remember seeing that I, uh, yeah, yeah there it, it is uh is it on there um, it anyway. says it says from the revelation that quote nothing real exists to no, the sad re but true sorry go on. nothing unreal exists not, not nothing real exists. sorry um, nothing unreal exists that's a different philosophical issue altogether but, um, <laughs> Yeah, there's another one where we've got Mr. Spock looking up at the clouds, you know, as we, we humans on a sunny, summer's day, we'll look up and think that cloud looks like a butterfly or that cloud looks, and he's looking up and he can see the pie symbol, you know, the mathematical symbol. 
mm. for pie in the clouds. So there's, they're kind of little quirky little drawings like that. Yeah, uh, Sirach was telling me the other day that when he looks up at the clouds, he actually sees the numerical pie and it just goes on <laughs> forever. <laughs> That's yeah, well, we could try. We could try that one. That would be a good one. A good follow up. <laughs> I'm sure Mr. Spock knows the. Um, I'm sure he knows it took to about a hundred points anyway. Hmm. So we've only got a yes, couple that- minutes left. I do want to uh, reiterate that all the the links to purchase these awesome and exciting books will be in the description box below. Uh, and anything else you'd like us to add, we'll also include the website. Uh, but these really sound like a lot of fun. Honestly, it seems like you've got two party books and a coffee table book is how I would look at it. Is that, is that what you think? The, the so, mindfulness, Mr. Spock's little book of mindfulness is a coffee book, coffee table book. You have it, you talk book. with your friends. Maybe. I think this is the one that you go to, you know, when you're quiet reflective moments or you you read it on the park bench when you want an interesting girl to come over and talk to you <laughs> makes you look deep and uh meaningful uh so that's why i would recommend with that one get your get your mask on go out to a park bench with your mr spot book of mindfulness and uh yes uh this is a very party atmosphere the this book it's a real celebration of star trek it's just a it's it's um full of so many silly uh, jokes and, you know, colourful uh, things that that's a lot of fun. And the cocktails is, is, a very, is, is you know, in moderation, it is a very party book. <laughs> I think, I think it, does, it does add a little bit of a smile to having a drink. It's not, you know, it, it, it's in, it, it, there's a lot of fun had with some of the twists on the drinks. And I think people will enjoy putting those together. Wow. Sirach, I, I wasn't sure if I stepped on you there. Did you have a, something, you, a final thing you were going to ask? Oh, we can't hear you all of a sudden. That's why. Sorry about that. Mm-mm. Lost you there. Subspace interference. Yeah, that's. Uh, we like to say it's Garrick. Whenever somebody messes with us, it's it's <laughs> Garrick jumping in and giggling around. Uh, Sirach storms off angrily and oh, handles Garrick I'm himself. To twice. I'm gonna I'm gonna make that the thing about when people ask me how did the interview go. I'm gonna say Sirach stormed off twice. <laughs> And then people will watch the show to see if I'm lying or not. Yeah. The, you could tell the Ciroc can still hear us, though, because he's laughing at it. Yeah. Um, yeah I don't know. Let's see. But, uh, yeah, definitely a, a party book. The The cocktails is... Oh, I think I just heard something. Ciroc, are you back? Yeah. I, yeah, Great. I'm back. I think so. Great. Yeah, we hear you. Up with those headphones. We hear you just fine. Was uh, there a final thing you were going to say? Sorry, we missed. Yeah. You. Well, you know, I just wanted to know if Glenn had ever had a chance to go to a convention and experience that. I'm I'm terrified of people, so um, I try to avoid conventions. Virtual TrekCon. Oh, <laughs> good point. <laughs> it's for people that don't go to conventions and people that do, but it's for everybody. Uh, I I, yeah. I do I do sometimes go to conventions, but not very often. But um, <laughs> While I'm, while I'm on, I just wanted to thank Ciroc for all those heart-rending stories he puts through on DS9. There's a, <laughs> hardly a dry eye in the house uh, on, on several, of the, several of them. So uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Speaking of which, you'll never thank guess you. which episode we are premiering this week. A review of The Visitor. Oh, Speaking The Visitor. Which, that was such a great episode. Gorgeous. Yeah. Well, talk Not about heart rending. I mean, that's another. That's another. Uh, no dry eye in the house. That's a classic, mm-hmm. isn't it? I love that one. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, yeah. Mr. Thank Glenn you. Dick, thank you, and thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Your books really seem awesome. Each one of them is uh, really something to discuss on its own, uh, and so it's really fun, kind of exploring all of them. And I do want to own all of them now. Yes, I'm pretty sure we can get a couple of t-shirts sent out to you. I'm not sure whether we can afford to send you all the books. I'll have to mm-hmm. um, twist somebody's arm. Well, either way, uh, thank you. We do appreciate that very much. Uh, but yeah, I have to thank be you. honest. As a Star Trek nerd, I do want all these books. <laughs> so, so you've done your job well. <laughs> Good, good. I, uh, we've put a lot of love into it. You know, we've really had a great... They have been a labour of love. We've put 
far more time into them than we should. And uh, it was quite sad. I mean, I felt quite remorseful when uh, the cocktail book was over. I had such a blast um, working on that. And we are already starting to think of some new ideas uh, for the next wave of books. So um, hopefully we'll be back with the, the, the Wrath of Cocktails Part 2. Awesome. The Wrath of Cocktails, nice. <laughs> well, uh, with that, uh, Mr. Glenn Dakin, thank you so much for taking the time. I know it's late uh, in the UK, but we do appreciate it very much. And everybody at home, please be sure that uh, you check out those links below. And hey, holidays are coming up, right? Great idea. Yeah. Uh, and it's um, it's Hero Collector. Is that is that the name? Hero Collector is uh, the you know you can search that. You can buy the stuff through there or through Amazon. Uh, that's the brand. Uh, Eagle Moss is the publisher. Um, who you know we do all the Star Trek uh, ship uh, model collections and stuff, and we're doing mm. loads of books about the ships uh, too. And, um, yeah, we got a whole wave of uh, Star Trek produce coming your way, so watch out. Awesome. Good. We'll include that as well. Uh, thanks very much. That's we'll, been great. Uh, we do Thank hope to see you again sometime soon at a convention or not. And be, uh, <laughs> It would be lovely to come over and to actually, you know, chill and, and meet some people. I was, uh, I was uh, kind of joking about being terrified of people. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a little bit of, it's you okay. know. Just, I'm oh, kind of oh. terrified of them, too. <laughs> it happens uh, right now we'll we have to socially distance <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Uh, everybody at home uh, we'll see you on the next one thank you so much and uh, so long <laughs>